Keith, you can just introduce this podcast. Hello, this is a podcast. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Couldn't have done it any better myself. Sounds, I need the pro. <laughs> sounds just like me. Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and guess who's back, 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 back? It's Keith. Welcome back, big dog. How's it going? Good. Good to be back. It is. It's good to have you. Good to have you back in the in the area we recorded. I guess yeah. again in the studio. <laughs> Keith, tell me a story. Anything creepy or weird, horror related happened to you uh, of late that you can you know tie into today's subject? Between now and the last time we spoke. Yes. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. When we spoke ages ago. Well, Keith, let me ask you this. All right, I'll set you. I'll get, let me right. give you a question. What's yes. the scariest thing that ever happened to you? And you have five seconds to think about it. Answer now. Oh my god. Uh, Putting you on the back step here. Does like a mortgage count? That's pretty <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> yeah, no, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. right. Financially scary. Yeah. Very financially scary. Yeah. You have to pay this money for the next 30 years of your life. <laughs> I, cr- I cry myself deep every night thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, I know. It's scary shit. <laughs> I'm like looking at your script, I'm like, where are you in this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, I, I, I told you, I have gone off all scripts all the time. I literally, this is just off the dome. What's new with you, Mike? You tell me. What, oh, what's the man, scariest thing? You're putting me on the freaking spot, man. What's Nothing. the scariest thing that's happened to you? Uh, I don't know. Nothing. Because you actually... being here right now, you ask me this question. I feel like I've got a gun pointed in my head. <laughs> hmm. Scariest thing that ever happened to me? Well, I've never seen a ghost, a UFO been attacked by a serial killer Mm. uh man i don't know nothing it probably wouldn't have to do my driving test um the fourth time having failed it three times although i only count two of those things being failures the third time the car had a warning light on it and the guy who didn't even take me out of the fucking car park to do the driving test so it was automatic fail before i'd even started the test can you believe that bullshit i still have to pay like the 80 bucks it costs to do the driving test that's bullshit i know what a fucking asshole that's not fair no, it's not. Yeah. So that was probably the scariest time was when I was doing my driving test for the fourth time and then I passed it with flying colours. Speaking of driving, I was in Canada, Canada. You were in Canada? And I was at a, this is like when Tesla first kicked off mm-hmm. and I was at one of those events. Yeah. And I was, I was only in the country not too long and we were at the event and they were doing out test drives of the car and they were like, oh. Would you like to drive the car? And I said, absolutely. And he said, do you have a valid license in Canada? I said, yes, which was a lie. <laughs> and But because I, I thought we were going to go around the car park. Yeah. And he was like, just take a left here. And then we were on the freaking motorway. Oh. That was terrifying. And you were driving this the car to Tesla? Like, yeah. And I was like driving. He's like, how much is this car? He's like, oh, it's about $120,000. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so immediately crash it. Is this a bad fun? time to tell you I don't have a license? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That was his fault for not checking. Yeah, exactly. I blame him. If you crash, you should blame <laughs> it's him. It's not my fault. Did you see that video of the Tesla that stopped in a tunnel and it caused this massive car pile? Is this dead tunnel for Tesla? The boring tunnel? Yeah. The boring tunnel, is that the one in like Las Vegas? I think yeah, it is? yeah. It's the stupidest fucking thing yeah. in the world. <laughs> it's like, yeah. how about we just build more roads under the <laughs> fucking ground? Wow. More roads. That always works. So how about futuristic cars? DeLoreans with a flux capacitor Ooh. going into the future, back to the future tree, the Wild West. Ooh, we got it back. Nice. We got it back. That was a good one. That was a good, that was good. Fair, fair play to you. We got a good segue. Yes, that was a great segue <laughs> because that takes us all the way back to the future, which is not the future, it's the past, the Wild West, the 1800s. Because today, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about Boone Helm, or as he's also known, the Kentucky Cannibal, which fucking rules. Badass. It is a cool ass nickname. Mm. Although he's called the Kentucky Cannibal, I guess because he's from Kentucky, but he didn't like spend terribly long there. Like all of his cannibal inging, he did like in California and Idaho and shit like that. Yeah, he was really briefly in in Kentucky. And like what we're talking about today is only what we know of. Like oh, there yeah. was times that he just disappeared off the map. Oh yeah, and then popped yeah. up again like five years later. There's a lot of question marks, as in this is what we think Boone Helm was doing for like five years. Mm. God only knows what he was actually doing. Yeah. But uh, he took those secrets to the grave with him. So, Boone Helm was a mountain man, a gunfighter, and he loved the taste of human flesh. I'm not sure why wouldn't you? Keith, would you ever eat a human? Would you ever chomp down on some human flesh? Like again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wink, wink. Like, I'm not even talking about like a survival situation. If somebody mm. came up to you, nice bit of human steak, T-bone steak, if you will, but okay. it was human flesh, would you try it? Eh, 
Like, obviously, obviously, as I said, if it was a life or death situation, obviously, yes. But I think for the sake of trying something new, probably no. Although, this was the Kentucky cannibal. So maybe he was frying up some human meat with some 11 spices and oh, herbs, you know? Yeah, maybe I could be a bit tempted, yeah. yeah. Get, get something like, kernels, KFP? <laughs> Kentucky good. fried that, people. That's good, I like that, <laughs> KFP. <laughs> you do? Uh, no. They say it good tastes um, like pork, I believe. Yeah, I've heard pork, chicken, yeah. Pork, it's what uh, a lot of people say it tastes like. Long pig, as our titular character would have called it. This old podcast episode is sponsored by Scentbird. You know, you know, it's important to smell good. I, I, I sure think so, and I'm not afraid to say it. So that when people, you know, give you a good old sniff, they like what you got. And there is no better place to get the perfect fragrance than Scentbird. Now, I hear you're barking, big dog. Scentbird, what be that? Well, Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service. Whether you be a smell noob or a fragrance aficionado, they got you. Scentbird lets you choose a new designer fragrance every month, from the big brands like Prada and Versace to up-and-coming indie labels for $17 a month. A huge deal as these fragrances can run in the hundreds of dollars. They have perfumes, colognes, and you get a 30-day supply, so you'll know everything there is to know about the delicious fragrance. For example, they sent me a number to try out. Modern Gentleman by Joseph Aboud, Masculine, well, hey, I mean, come on, it's like me. But also herbal, sweet, and distinctive. A again, like me. They also sent me Sweet Taboo by Chris Collins, which I really liked. It was like a warm and inviting coffee and vanilla scent. And finally, Awaken by Toomey, which was probably my favorite. Citrusy and woody, which gives you a very fresh and summery sniff. So if you want to be smelling good this summer, please visit the link below and make sure you use code THATCHAPTER to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird.com. Available in the USA and Canada. It's just a tiny bit over $7 for your first month. Thank you so much to Scentbird for sponsoring this whole episode. Now let's get back to it. All right, let's give it a goo. The tale of Levi Boone. Wait, Levi Boonehelm. Oh, wait, let me redo that. The tale of Boonehelm, or Levi Boonehelm, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. His full name. His full name, I suppose. But Boonhelm sounds way cooler. It does. So, to say the 19th century was a time of turmoil and constant change for the US would be probably a bit of an understatement. You had the Civil War, slavery that was still going on. The Wild West was still very wild. They had wars with Native Americans ongoing. And when I say war, I mean genocides would be a pretty more accurate way of putting it. Uh, a lot of immigration, new folk arriving. Uh, things were pretty much kind of all over the place. I guess you would say it that way. And into that world was born Levi Boone Helm, the man who would become known as the Kentucky Cannibal. And he was born in 1828. Now, there is no harder time than the frontier years of the United States, and no tougher men than those born into the violent whirlwind of Western expansion. They really were living on the edge of society, and yeah. there was a fuck ton of ways to die. Yeah, yeah. Like, to get a time reference here? You might even say a million ways to die. A million ways to die? Ooh. Ooh. Boo and Helm, he was born in 1828. This is just 24 years after the legendary explorers Lewis and Clark. Mm. They absolutely set out on their famous expedition to explore the newly acquired western portion of the country. It was lawless, and if diseases like cholera, tuberculosis, and influenza didn't get you, you could just die from exposure. That's dying from just existing. The interesting thing, though, about our character, who is a wild, sick, sadistic, this guy's a real piece of shit. He's a really interesting guy, though, because what's crazy about Boone Helm is, you know, yeah, you have a mountain man, he was a cannibal, he was a gunfighter, he would go around murdering people willy-nilly before he met his own, uh, you know, tricky end. He was born, though, into relative luxury. Look at you and a mm. silver spoon in your gob. You know, he, he was he was born into, like, this wealthy family in, in Kentucky, but... You know, the situations he would find him in throughout his life, compared to how he was born, it was like he wanted to suffer. Mm. He wanted the pain. He want like he, it's not like he became a cannibal and a murdering mountainous man because it, that was the way he was born and he had no choice. He did it because he wanted to, to do it. He put himself in those situations. Yeah, he could have like easily just gone back and been a rich kid and like yeah. at any point. Well, kind of, sort of, we'll yeah. get into it, but it's really weird. It's, it's like he actively sought out discomfort and pain. I hear his mother was quick at temper though and was prone to violent outbursts. Mm. 
Like, even though like, he was somewhat pri- privileged, like, he was still growing up in a very rough environment. Um, I'm sure he was exposed to a lot of violence from a young age. After all, like, at five years old, him and his family, they moved to the frontier town of Monroe County. And that was very much living on the borderland between civilization and the savage frontier of the West. Yeah. But he went a lot fucking further than his little town. He just kept going. (laughs) Yeah, he he didn't stop. He didn't stop. (laughs) He was a man who was all about it. For him, the journey was the destination. Helm reveled in the suffering of others and was undoubtedly a sociopath who thought very little of the pain he inflicted. He was as cruel and cold-blooded as they come. There's a good quote, actually. It's uh, a prolific uh, biographical Wild West author, Emerson Hugh. He wrote the following in a book titled Levy Boone Helm, Murderer, Cannibal and Thief, published in 1907. Boone Helm was bad and nothing in the world could ever have made him anything but bad. He was by birth and breeding, low, coarse, cruel, animal-like and utterly depraved. And for him, no name but ruffian can fittingly apply. Throughout his teens and as a young man, Helm became well known in the local area of central Kentucky, Lincoln County, for his willingness to show off his physical prowess. He was happiest when displaying his survival skills. One of Helm's favorite tricks was to throw his bowie knife into the ground and retrieve it from horseback while at full gallop. Helm became notorious around town for getting radar strunk, getting into fights with anyone who looked too long in his direction. On one occasion that would quickly become local legend, after a sheriff attempted to arrest him, Helm decided that the appropriate response was to ride his horse into the courthouse and scream obscenities at the sitting judge. That sounds like the start of a bad joke. Yeah, exactly. A horse walks into a courtroom with a cannibal on his back. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Now, that was something to which the Helm family was becoming sadly all too accustomed to, and a situation that was slowly dragging them far away from the comfort they had worked so hard for and into the difficulties Helm seemed desperate to inflict on everyone he met. In his early years, it seemed like he was kind of cosplaying as a wild man in his own little town. In 1848, when Helm was 20 years old, he married 17-year-old Lucinda Frances Browning, Monroe County, and they had a daughter named Lucy the very next year in 1849. Lucinda quickly became the target of Helm's cruelty. And it became a regular occurrence for her to bear the brunt of Helm's impotent frustrations, which usually took the form of some savage beatings. I think Boonhelm could only get it up with the taste of blood in his mouth, pretty much, is what I'm kind of gathering from this. Yeah, I, I feel he definitely could have been like a sexual sadist. Yeah. Like inflicting physical and psychological suffering to another person just to get off. Yeah. Takes the boxes. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. And if it wasn't enough for Helm to drag his family down from their previously good standing in the community, his violent treatment of Lucinda would end up ruining his family financially also. When the young woman petitioned for divorce, citing the ever-increasing levels of domestic abuse, Helm's father paid the costs, which left the family bankrupt. This is So this will come up again later on in the story, but his family really must have loved him. Yeah. They did a lot for him. They were a good family. They were a good family. Like, they went... Apart from him. Yeah, apart from him. Like, why didn't they cut him off? I have no idea. Because he... So he ruined his entire family by being a little dickhead who just ran around... <laughs> playing cowboy. Around. Yeah, playing cowboy. Yeah. Essentially, it's really, really strange. You think they'd be just like, here, listen, fuck, you're out in your ass here. Yeah. I'm not fucking paying for you anymore. But I guess his family were pretty decent in that way. Mm. Uh, but unfortunately, too decent for Boone Helm. Essentially, after he bankrupted his family by, as you said, cosplaying as a mountain man cowboy <laughs> and then beating the shit out of his wife and then ruining his family's reputation and their bank account, he was like, well, I am all done here. See y'all in another <laughs> life. He just noped out of there. He was yeah. like, all right, you guys are of no more use to me anymore because you have no money. I'm going to chase adventure and riches in California. See you. He's going to uh, be bodacious, go to California, say... Cowabunga surfing, <laughs> other California things. Give that f- surf a lifestyle, dude. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, hey, t- yeah. Now, several of Helm's 12 siblings had already met with violent deaths after heading to the Pacific coast. And so Helm was like, sounds great. <laughs> yeah. like, Why me wouldn't in. I go? Yeah, I'd yeah. be stupid not to go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what killed them definitely won't kill me. And so he set off regardless. Helm arranged with a buddy, a neighbor named Littlebury Shoot. They would travel to California together. Now, though Shoot initially agreed to accompany Helm, he later, probably after spending five fucking minutes with the psycho, was like, ah, uh, you know what? I might just go there alone, actually. Yeah. Ooh, I don't want to, like, <laughs> hang out with you. 
That did not end well for Littlebury Shoot when he decided to back out of this joint venture. It's commonly speculated that Littlebury only agreed to participate in the journey to placate Helm, who was on one of his regular drunken benders. But then, of course, Helm being the total madman that he was, as soon as Littlebury tried to back out of this journey, he did the logical thing. And he murdered Littlebury Shoot by stabbing him between the ribs and then being like, alright, I'm off on my Todd. From, from reports, when this went down, Boone he calmly approached Shoot place his hand on his shoulder and have like a friendly conversation with him and then suddenly without any warning at all just pulled out a knife and stabbed him so it really just shows how much of a yeah. sociopath he was right. showing like no remorse or empty at all yeah but like, like as awful as it is that he got stabbed it, it could have been way worse for him if he actually had have agreed to go with him in the end oh yeah, yeah like yeah, imagine sure. like going on like what fate worse than stabbing might have he seen if he had went on a road trip with a cannibal yeah it could have been a lot worse it could have been worse yeah. I mean yeah I suppose so Still, silver lining and yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he's lucky he got stabbed with the ribs if he has me. yeah he got <laughs> out easy by dying but unfortunately for Helm and several other people including Littleberry Shoot's brother they weren't quite so chill with him murdering a man and they set out in pursuit of Helm as he marched west and it didn't take long for the posse to catch up with the nonchalant Helm and they easily took him by surprise at a reservation and returned him to custody in Monroe County to be tried for Littlebury's murder. It's very civil of the posse. I know, you think they would just like string him up right there and then. Kill the fucker. Unsurprisingly, Helm was found guilty and convicted of murder. And it wasn't long into his sentence that Helm's behavior caught the attention of his jailers. And after being given a psychological assessment, he was moved to an asylum where his bizarre behavior completely changed and he became calm. And he became reasonable. This is very, like, yeah, sophisticated, by the way, for, like, 1800s jail, like, that they were, he was given a psychological assessment and sent to a, a mental health center, old-timey, like, asylum. Like, this is, like, you think they would just lock him away and throw away the keys? Like, yeah. Jesus. Now, of course, this is all a ruse. He knew escaping jail wouldn't be impossible. Now, it would, it's not impossible to escape jail, but why bother with the risk of trying to escape jail when you can just pretend you're crazy and go to an asylum where it's much easier to escape because that's exactly what he did he kind of pulled the one flew over the cuckoo's nest he did indeed yeah. the court noted that helm's manner was not only unbecoming but unbalanced and so helm wasted no time in acting as the model patient inmate and he even managed to befriend a guard who he then talked into taking him on regular walks outside the grounds of the asylum and then whoa shockingly <laughs> you'll never get this no <laughs> no, what did he do? <laughs> On one of these walks, Helm decided he'd had enough of this prison asylum bullshit, and he simply kind of like walked off. Like, all right, <laughs> smell you later. What are you gonna do, like? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they probably were like, here, listen, fucking yeah. let him go. Uh, like, like, that's not worth it. They go after him, like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Kentucky prison system is like not our problem. Yeah, I don't get paid enough for that. We're not this. Yeah. We're not fucking dealing with this like psychopathic piece of shit. <laughs> so then, uh, yeah, he easily evaded the state federal authorities that they were kind of like having a quick goo at him and then he arrived in california shortly afterwards ready to start his life again and when i say start his life again i mean he just continued to live it the way he'd already done which was however he damn well pleased hell yeah hell yeah brother now very few details are known about helm's journey to the west coast what little we do know is taken from second and third hand accounts historians can be pretty confident though that helm killed several more people in various run-ins along the journey to california again this is kind of one of those periods in helm's life when it's like a bit of a question mark we don't really know what he's been up to but we can fairly like safely assume it was a lot i mean at this point he was already becoming a legend right yeah like it's it definitely is true that he's becoming a legend however like it's also around the same time that as other very well uh, known outlaws and gunfighters, such as mm. Billy the Kid and Jesse James and yeah. Doc Holliday, they're household names. Um, however, like Boone Helm it is not really as well known as the other guys or have the same notoriety. Like, I know personally myself, uh, I hadn't heard of him before researching the story. What? I think uh, with like Billy the Kid and Jesse James, even though they were killers, it's easy to romanticize their mm. stories. They were very cool and charming. Like Billy the Kid, he was a Robin Hood type yeah. character. And, but instead of like robbing for the, from the rich and giving to the poor, he robbed from the rich and gave to himself. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, he was, was really a symbol of uh, anti-establishment. However, with like Boo and Helm, he had absolutely no redeeming qualities. At yeah, all. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I guess you can't really ro romanticize this guy. 
So he arrived, he rocked up in California, and the lawlessness of the California frontier suited him down to the ground. And, and essentially because California was so lawless, it was easy for him to evade capture and also evade falling into the hands of pissed off relatives of the people he killed. But it also provided him with the means to satisfy his lust for blood and his greed for the gold. And so, after spending several years roaming around California, adding bodies and gold to his ledger, he resurfaced in the spring of 1858 when he arrived in Oregon County, along with his little posse of six other men. Now, Oregon County at the time stretched much further east than it does today. What is today, broken up into Washington State, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, was then in 1858, divided between the Oregon, Washington, and Nebraska territories before these were subdivided into states, with the rest of the huge Nebraska territory being made up of what is now the Dakotas and, well, Nebraska. Shortly after arriving at Dales in Oregon County, Helm learned of a desire for his extradition from authorities back in California, which spurred him and his group to attempt the arduous journey to Camp Floyd, Utah. So he arrived in Oregon County hearing that people in California wanted his ass, which was quite a lot of people. But it's very hard to overstate just how shitty these places were back in the day. Like how, you know, it was completely wild and lawless. So, you know, any kind of arduous journey was... What's more arduous than arduous? Whatever that is. Really arduous. Really <laughs> arduous. Yeah, that's the word. Well said. Yes, that's exactly. It's really Ooh, arduous. Ingly good. Yeah. <laughs> And so now he was going to have to make his uh, make a trip to Camp Floyd, which lay 60 miles southwest of Salt Lake City, and took in a whole lot of hostile territory in both the terms of like indigenous population and also just the natural geography of the land, like the, the Donner Party that would have been traversing the area around this time. He had the Oregon Trail, all that. Like traveling this part of the country was no joke whatsoever. The Donner Party, man, crazy shit. And another one rife with cannibalism as well. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, they're, they're all cannibals during this time of year. <laughs> What's going on here? It's like that movie. You ever seen the movie Ravenous? It's a good movie. You should check it out. I mean, it's one of those movies where I think it's good. I haven't seen it in like 10 years. Maybe it's not <laughs> shit, but I remember it being good. Anyways, besides the point. It's also worth noting that in 1858 was the year of the Utah War. The Utah War, it's essentially this big old, it's a big old sitch. It's way too complicated to go into here, but needless to say, Utah at the time was a political powder keg. You might say Mormons were there, locking and loading. They feared they were being persecuted by essentially the, the United States government was trying to put law into lawless land, and they did not like that at all. You had your Brigham Young, and essentially this is where some of the sparks that would later become the Civil War were, were starting to, to spark up. So... That should give you some idea of just how much Boonhelm desired to evade justice and civilized society. He would rather venture into the most unstable and untamed parts of the country. Helm and his companions had already traveled together for some time, and so he had his little posse of about six men. Now here's the story, right? A Dr. William H. Groves later recounted details of a drunken evening around the fire with Helm and his men. According to Dr. Groves, Helm told another man named McGranigan. Such a cowboy name. <laughs> Helm said this. Many's the poor devil I've killed at one time or another, and the time has been that I've been obliged to feed on them. McGranigan then looked at Dr. Groves' direction and he said, Yes, and we'll be having more of that feast than yet. Nice. Nice. So McGranigan was basically look, talking to Helm and Helm was saying, Yeah, I've eaten quite a few people. And then McGranigan was looking at the doctor saying, Yeah, we'll eat you too. And so, after Helm suggested a plan to rustle cattle from the local Walla Walla tribe, Dr. Groves did what anyone with half a functioning brain would likely do and was like, yeah, I don't really want to hang out with these guys anymore. Uh, he Irish goodbye them, essentially. Good for him. Yeah. Groves returned to Dales and he immediately sent word of Helm's intentions to the Walla Walla chief, telling him to keep an extra careful watch on their horses, which at the time numbered in the thousands. So Groves effectively ruined Helm's plans of stealing horses. And so, once autumn came, Helm and his remaining five companions set back out on the road once more. The group left their base at the Grande Ronde River in late October and would soon find out just how terrible an idea it was to try and cross the mountains and hostile territories in weather that was often 30 or 40 below zero. Again, the exact details of what took place on the more than 500-mile trip are scarce and are built on Helm's own account. Helm's, 
being the only one of the group to emerge alive in April 1859. So it took him about it took him about six months. Oh, okay, okay. To get there, like in autumn, and then they they he emerged alive in April. Helm detailed the terrible adventure of the prior months to a man named John W. Powell, who later shared the story in a letter to a friend. According to Powell, he was camped near Fort Hall after crossing the Snake River while on his way to Salt Lake City, when he was confronted by Boone Helm. Powell described Helm as a, quote, tall, cadaverous, sunken-eyed man. Helm was dressed in a dirty, torn coat and had on shoes that were so worn that they could scarcely be tied to his feet. Powell took pity on the obviously starved man and invited him into his temporary lodge. Once inside and rested, Helm began to recount his company's ill-fated journey. And this is when the legend of the Kentucky Cannibal really began. He told the story of what he'd been up to over the last six months. He told Powell that shortly after they'd reached the Raft River in southern Idaho, they were attacked by a group of natives. The attack turned into a running firefight that stretched on for several miles. According to Helm, the attack was completely unprovoked. Wink, wink. Given his, you know, I mean, he earlier tried to steal horses from another tribe, so it's probably very likely he probably tried to steal from this one too. They somehow managed to escape without any of the group being killed or even seriously hurt, at least for now. Once they had put some distance between themselves and their pursuers, the group set up camp late in the same evening with a sentry watching over their horses at the Bannock River. During the night, one of these sentry guards was killed and a horse taken. The men quickly agreed it was far too risky to stick around and set out once again. So at this point, I guess they were like really driven off course and they were completely in unfamiliar territory. Yeah, they, yeah. Like, they were lost at this point. 100% and this is getting into winter in these mountainous areas in like Idaho where, you know, it's pretty... um. The mountains there, like, when you read about stories of doing the Oregon Trail, I think, like, you know, the Idaho, Utah, Utah area was, like, the hardest part of the journey. Because you had these incredible mountains, and then you had these salt flats. Yeah. So it's like you're going from one extreme to another. Like they, When, like, you were doing your journey, it's not only, like, you had to pick the months you were going. Oh, yeah, 100%. Make sure, this like, had to be planned out. Yeah, like, you yeah. couldn't just willy-nilly be like, oh, I'm just going to rock over there. It's like, no, you'll fucking die. You're fucked. So, that's, well, that's exactly what Boone Helm did. And so, unfortunately for them, what had been grey overcast skies when they started out quickly became a snowball throwing storm clouds and the group were threatened with snow blindness to the point they were simply wandering aimlessly and had no, no direction like they were headed in. They were essentially just wandering randomly. By the morning, things had gotten so bad they didn't even realise nighttime had passed. The sun was blotted out by solid sheets of snow. Finally, just as their horses were beginning to struggle with exhaustion and the thigh-deep blanket of snow was killing them, several familiar landmarks came into view, enough that the men could finally work out where they were. They had reached Soda Springs, Bear River, Idaho. They followed the river, where the horses finally gave up out of sheer exhaustion. Very luckily for the men, they found an abandoned cabin that made for the perfect and surprisingly comfortable shelter to get them through the worst of the weather. As it turns out, the relief the men felt when finding that little rundown cabin would end up, uh, this is at a good times. This is the good part of the trip. Not being able to hunt and having no access to any edible food, like crops or anything like that, provisions that were running out very, very quickly. I know in like in winter in Soda Springs, so it's it's surrounded by these huge snow-capped mountains. And while rainfall in Soda Springs is pretty low, the, there's like absolutely no shortage of snow in this place <laughs> at all. It's one of the snowiest towns in California, and it receives around 192 inches of snow a year, so seven times the national average. So at this point in the journey, they were in the throes of winter. So they, they couldn't hunt, as you said, because a lot of animals would have been hibernating, and other big game like deer and elk, they would have migrated already to mm. areas with much less snow. They were on the Bear River and near Bear Lake, but as they were not equipped to for fishing, let alone ice fishing. Yeah. Because they set out on like on horseback, they could only carry very, very small provisions with them. So they were in some serious trouble at this point. And unfortunately for their horses, who were essentially have no use to the men anymore, um, well, they're looking mighty good. 
And so, horses could provide, you know, enough meat to sustain the men for weeks to come. And so, one by one, they killed the horses and they worked through the now very lean meat they provided. Helm noted that they'd actually held off as long as possible on killing the last horse, as it had previously been valued at over $1,000, as it was a thoroughbred racehorse. Ooh, look at you. But they knew they would have to kill it sooner or later. They tried to delay it as long as possible. Eventually, though, they gave in to hunger, and they sat down for some very expensive meals. That's another $5 at each bite. It was expensive, but not very nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it means lean meat, so it's... Yeah, like, even, like, like, not very... Like, like, fillet steak is... That's one of the most unused... Like, that's, like, a premium cut of beef. And yeah. that's because it's, like, an unused muscle base, so it's mm. real tender, where yeah, I can yeah, only yeah. imagine, like, a thoroughbred racehorse... It's pure muscle, like, hard muscle. Every muscle's used. It's a yeah. racehorse. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, kind of just the best. Now, I'm sure at the time they weren't, like, concerned. I think they were caring. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't imagine... Oh, ah, like, no, I don't like this. Oh, <laughs> no, I only have Phyllis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So, they... Well, they chowed the shit down. They jerked the rest of the meat, and then they made snowshoes from the hides of the horses. Now, they knew with the horses gone and no sign of the punishing weather subsiding, staying meant certain death. They hoped to reach Fort Hall, or at least run into hopefully better equipped and provisioned fellow travellers along the way. Some salvation, whether it be place or people. But <laughs> you kind of got to hope they didn't run into any people because that would not have ended well for anybody who ran into Boonhelm and his little gruesome gang. After doubling back on themselves and returning to Soda Springs, four of the group had become so exhausted they could barely walk. On top of that, the little meat that was left was not going to last much longer. The, you know the old adage, no man left behind? Helm. Nah, eh, not for him. And so him and another man named Burton decided they were not going to be slowed down with these chumps. They were going to make their own way. Every man for himself in the Wild West. That's it, but uh, that's that adage is very true for Burton as well, because things did not end well for him neither. But Helm and Burton, they were hardier than the rest of the group, and they actually managed to reach Snake River, which they planned to follow in hopes it would lead them to Fort Hall, southeast Idaho. Their plan was fairly sound, and it would have worked, but for Burton, the final stretch was just too much for his weakened body to manage, and fatigue overtook his mind to the point he was just unable to continue on. Just as Burton was giving up, him and Helm found another abandoned house. The two, they had not meat for days, and they had subsisted on a prickly pear plant that grew locally. Which is a cactus. It is a cactus. Yeah, that was a surprising fact. They ate a cactus. <laughs> Cute with the facts over here. <laughs> Helm, in hopes that Fort Hall was not too much further, he left Burton at the cabin, and he set out alone. He did eventually reach the fort, and it was empty. Fuck. <laughs> Helm turned around, and he returned to Burton at the cabin. Burton was starving, snowblind, delirious, and essentially pretty much at death's door. Nothing much Burton could really do to help the situation, except for one thing. There was one more thing he could do to help out Boone's survival, and that was to follow the same route the horses had taken. Now, Helm's version of events, as he told to Powell, was that Helm, he'd gone out in search of firewood, you know, and if he could find any kind of roots or something to eat. And when he was gone, he heard a... He rushed back to the cabin and then he found Burton had at a revolver. Okay. <laughs> That's his story anyway. Yeah, it sounds very, very likely it happened. So what Helm did was he took the meat of Burton's thighs. He consumed one of them during his preparations for the journey. The other he dressed, as they had previously done with the horse meat, and he packed it out for the trip ahead. He actually wore Burton's leg meat in a sling made from an old red flannel shirt tied across his shoulder, and he set out with a big old leg on his, on his fucking back. Hmm. Look at you. You could say it was uh, the last leg of the journey. Ooh, <laughs> that's good. That is good. That's good. I like that. <laughs> I was, I was, I was, I was actually I was curious into about the dangers of eating human meat. Oh. Um, so interesting, uh, even though I was wrong, uh, consuming cooked human flesh is no more dangerous than eating cooked flesh of other animals. And this is true for the majority of most of the human body. However, there is one organ that people should avoid eating at all costs, and that is the brain. Mm. This is yeah. not a joke about zombies. <laughs> You get Kuru. 
uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, the four people of Papua New Guinea uh, practice the ritual of eating deceased relatives. Uh, this isolated group they demonstrated the serious ramifications of eating another human's brain. Kuru, as you rightly said, is a fatal uh, transmissible degenerative brain disorder or disease similar to mad cow disease. Mm. In the 1950s, you go crazy. You go crazy. Yeah, it's it's also known as the as a laughing sickness uh, because of the pathological bursts of laughter that people uh, with illness would display. So if you got to eat someone for survival, stay away from the brain, or eat them for survival because. It sounds like it must be pretty good. I mean, if people who eat it are laughing all the time, it must they must be having a pretty good time if they're laughing all the if time. If you're going to go, right? out, go out laughing, hey. yeah, it must be great. They're having a great time. They're laughing. Look at him. He's having a great time. <laughs> Less than 10 miles after butchering Burton and chomping down on his legs and... Hey, I don't want to. I don't want to put words in his mouth. He's already put enough food in his mouth. Really? Who knows what else he was eating? You know what I'm saying? He really, really put his foot in it. <laughs> Yo, very nice. If you were to eat somebody, mm. a human. Okay. Me, perhaps. Right. What part? I mean, do you think you'd go for the tie? Or I hear the, the butt cheeks. I mean, come on. I don't want to eat somebody's butt, though. Uh, I feel I kind of want to go with something that doesn't look human. So maybe like an internal organ. You know, like the like the liver or something like that. Have you ever had liver? No. Tastes like shit. <laughs> Doesn't, okay, maybe not the liver. Then. No, well, no. I, I mean, I haven't had human liver. Maybe it's delicious. <laughs> like, never had, like, Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to point it. Have you ever had, like, you know, like, like uh, liver? Like, some people eat liver? Like, um, I don't know what kind of... Yeah, I don't li- know what fucking kind like of... Like liver and onions and... Yeah. yeah, have you ever had it? No, I haven't. It's, liver is... No, it's God awful. Nice. I think folks listening at home, if you like liver, we're, we're not being friends. It's gross <laughs> as shit. It tastes rank. No good. It's nasty. It's got a disgusting texture. It's like a weird color. No. What part no. would you go for? Uh, face. Face. Yeah. What? I want to eat the face. Straight in. Yeah, exactly. While you're strangling them? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Probably to go for the face. I want to feel it. I, I feel... Hey, listen. It's like how you say, if you want to eat meat, you should really, like, kill the chicken yourself so that you know the value of it. If I'm going to eat a human, come on. Like, I'm not fucking around here. It's dark. Yeah, I know. Love it. <laughs> Straight in there, dude. <laughs> so, after less than 10 miles from the cabin where he gobble gobbled Burton, Boone Helm met a native man at a small lodge with his family. Helm asked the man to guide him, but the man told him he himself was starving and his family didn't have enough as it was. Helm quickly changed the man's mind by offering him handfuls of gold. He allowed Helm to stay at the lodge, and he charged him $10 a meal, which consisted of ants and something like tobacco leaves. Powell, in recounting this tale, claimed that Helm teared up and appeared broken when telling him this part of the story, which sounds like bullshit. Helm begged Powell for any food he could offer, and offered him his last $9 in exchange. Powell, not being a complete sociopath like Boone Helm, wouldn't take any money and simply helped him out of pity. And at least your part of Helm's story was actually corroborated because Powell would actually meet the Native American man Boone Helm had met, who had stayed with. Someone actually Powell knew for a couple of years. His name was Mo Quip. And he told Powell, indeed, Helm had stayed with him, stayed with his family. He had given him, you know, ants and tobacco leaves and, you know, Boone Helm been paying him uh, gold coins. And that Boone Helm had indeed been carrying meat strapped in a red flannel across his body. Mo Quip also told him... Helm had shared the meat with him before he had told him where he'd gotten the meat. Oh my god. Yeah, can you imagine? I mean, he shared the meat with him before he told him. This is this is human. <laughs> what is this? This is delicious. Man flesh. <laughs> yeah. Man flesh. <laughs> Man flesh. <laughs> he'd even recalled telling Helm that the meat was bueno game and was better than any he'd had himself. So he did like it. Maybe he, yeah. He converted him. <laughs> exactly. Kind of, is that, that's how it gets you. That's how you become a Wendigo. Don't knock it, man. Yeah, it's not. It's always the stories. It's like zombies, Wendigos, even in Ravenous. It's like you become mm. addicted to eating human flesh. Mm. I know. Gotta be careful. It's a slippery slope, <laughs> <Yeah>. my friends. <laughs> Helm continued to live the outlaw life after his narrow escape with the elements and then becoming a cannibal. Straight up. He stole a herd of horses in Washington Territory. He drove them to Vancouver for sale. He was a wanted man in pretty much every state and territory from coast to coast, but he simply didn't give a shit. It didn't hurt Helm's continuing freedom that the stories of his tastes in dining had spread around the country. Boone Helm was already being whispered in hushed tones in in bars and around around campfires. Boone Helm would become a ghost story in his own 
a lifetime of this wild outlaw cannibal, a living boogeyman. To lawmen, he was just more trouble than he was worth, and to the government, well, he didn't cause them enough trouble to warrant a substantial enough a reward to entice any wannabe heroes, you know, to to go out and get him. And so, Helm spent the next few years enjoying the freedom that fear and notoriety brought him. He spent time in Salt Lake, and he also worked. <laughs> this was kind of funny. He worked as a Danite, which is essentially a hitman for Mormons. <laughs> That's fucking awesome. Yeah, I know, it's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. like, Webster's Dictionary defines it as being a member of a secret association of Mormons held to have been pledged to use violent means to destroy their enemies. Now, I don't think Boonhelm was actually Mormon, but um, he was like, ah, fuck, I'll kill people for you. Why not? Yeah, I like kill people. Yeah, it's like yeah. Assassin's Creed for Mormon, the Mormon version. If you're good at something, yeah, don't do it for free. Don't do it for free, exactly. And he's alleged to have taken out a couple of men who were causing the Mormon authorities issues. This was again during the Utah War when the Mormons were, were getting down and dirty. However, after he'd killed a few people for Mormons, um, they kind of wanted him gone also. You know, it's like tie up loose ends over here. Helm swiftly moved on, once again emerging in the spring of 1862 in the town of Florence, Oregon, where he quickly made himself at home amongst the rough and ready community of miners and fellow outlaws. One of those ruffians was a man known as Dutch Fred. Fred was usually addressed by locals as Chief, but it was out of respect more than fear. Though Fred was known to be a rough and tough fighter, more skilled in a fight than most and always a willing gambler, he was also known to be like an honest, hard-working man. Like, he just liked to fight, but he wasn't like a bully or a dickhead. He just, he just enjoyed fighting. Despite having a reputation for being kind, generous, and gentle, a few drinks, though, would drastically reduce the amount of provocation Fred needed to lock and load his arms. Helm, though he himself was a large and powerful man, as well as a giant piece of shit, and he took a request from an associate who apparently didn't fancy facing Fred man to man. After several others had made sure to get one too many sups glug glugs into Fred, Boone Helm approached Fred as he was sitting playing a card game called Faro in the town's saloon. Helm then proceeded to taunt Dutch Fred with insults and even made sure to flash the old revolver. Ooh, look what I got. Now, old Dutch Fred, he was no coward. He drew his knife and he walked up to Helm. Likely not wanting to get caught in any potential crossfire, Fred's fellow drinkers and several bystanders managed to catch both men and rid them of their weapons. The pistols and knives were given to the bartender, put away for safekeeping. With that, the commotion died down and Fred returned to his card game, and Helm seemed to settle, even apologizing for the ruckus and leaving the bar room and coming back a few hours later, and, well, you know how this is not going to end well. Helm made several apologies. He asked for his pistol back, promising, oh, I won't cause any more trouble, and, you know, just give me my gun, and I'll be, I'll be out of your hair, you know me. The bartender gave Helm his gun back. No sooner than the revolver touched his palm, Helm turned and began to shout vile insults at Fred, firing a shot that missed its target. With Fred probably being, you know, too brave for his own good and maybe just believing that Helm had missed on purpose and was trying to scare him, Dutch Fred approached Helm and folded his arms across his chest, essentially squaring up to him. Unfortunately, he had drastically underestimated just how much of a shithouse Helm was and there he took a second shot from Helm's pistol to the heart. Dutch Fred dropped dead on the spot and Helm pointed his revolver at the crowd. Essentially, who else wants to follow fucker over here? Obviously, uh, no one else did. He fled town and was ultimately never punished for the murder of Dutch Fred, but this was another fucking feather in the cap of Boone Helm's reputation. And there was, at this point, very few places left for him to go where he wouldn't immediately face arrest. I mean, really, his wanted level was at an all-time high, like five stars in GTA terms, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Did he try the cheat codes? <laughs> you know, the left, right, X squared. Oh, fuck, I forgot the Konami code. This is an interesting one, because after he killed Dutch, fled town, and he actually started making his way uh, to the gold fields of Caribou in British Columbia. However, on route... Helm and another shady character caught wind of a fellow named uh, Sokolsky and two French-Canadian associates who were carrying 32,000 in coarse gold mm. and heading towards Quinzel, Quinell, uh, Forks. So Helm and his partner stalked these men 
And as the party neared the destination, they stopped off in Keatley Creek, where they had dinner before setting out on the trail again for the final leg of the journey. Yeah. However, unknowing to them, Helm and his partner, they were laying in wait to mm. ambush them. Aha! When their bodies were found, every man's pistol was empty of, of bullets. So the three men, they did put up a brave fight, but unfortunately they were caught off guard and uh, by surprise, so they were bested. After Helm and his partner shot and killed the three men, and it's assumed they buried most of the gold, they left the bodies on the side of the trail. And then they headed quickly into Quinell Forks, intending to retrieve the gold uh, yeah. when things kind of calmed down. The bodies, they were... They did a really piss poor job hiding them, so they were <laughs> soon discovered. Very quickly, they were able to figure out who was responsible for this. After all, like, there was three people killed not too far away, and then all of a sudden, two shady-looking strangers just blew into town. Yeah. So it didn't take a genius to put two and two together here. So a posse, they were quickly put together, and they were hot in the trail of Helm and his partner. Once again, uh, they managed to elude capture, but as... Uh, as he had to leave town in such a hurry, they never had time to go back where they'd buried the gold. Ah, goddamn! They did go plan to go back a different date, obviously, but it didn't pan out the way. So, thirty two thousand in gold in the eighteen hundreds is a couple of million in today's money. So is they were still there. It was never found. Could still be out there, it was folks. Never if you're listening, found. where was it near the what river? It was so they were coming from Keatley Creek. Keatley Creek. And they were making their way down don't to... Don't say it too loudly. Don't, don't tell the audience. Yeah, don't no, no, shh. <laughs> I want to find out. This is you and me, bro. We're, we're getting this call. Don't tell the audience. Bro. Okay, so it was in Keatley Creek and they were making their way down to Quinell Forks. Yeah, maps. So it's, it's actually, it's not a long journey. They were only like a, I'd say, like half a day's ride away. And they were like, stopped off. We'll have our dinner and we'll head down. And this is the, like, the account of this is there was a man that was, they were with them. So there was three in this party. But there was also a fourth member and he, instead of stopping off in Keatley Creek, he made his way down to uh, Quinell Forks. And on his way down the path, he passed Boone Helm and his partner. And this is all documented. So he's seen him go up. Yeah. Then the three members, they never came back. But, ah. uh, Boone Helm and his partner came back and the gold was gone. So yeah. Just, gone for now. Gone for now. There's gold out there uh, somewhere, boys. Yeah. Yeah, let's take a quick old trip to British Columbia. The only place I'm going now is Dickey Creek. Falls near the Fraser River. Man, this is... Did you look up Keatley Creek? Yeah. Uh, for people who are listening to this at home, stop listening. We're trying yeah. to find gold. So uh, you can't listen to this and then get to the gold force. Just saying. Legally, you can't. It's ours. Yeah. <laughs> I said it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dibs. I, Double I, dibs. I, I dig I bag it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, it, you have to give it to me legally. Oh, man. This is even more remote than the previous place i was looking at which is wrong keat so yeah like k-e-i-t-h-l-e-y wow this is like real it's like near the mountains and shit near jasper i don't even know how you get there yeah because that's near yeah like right beside a lake and then yeah not sure it's worth it so anywhere the goal is basically i guess anywhere between keatley creek and quinnell forks which by bike is two hours 42 minutes so i don't know what that is by horse probably similar probably quicker i assume no what, do you think a horse is faster than a bike? How about you go by horse, I'll go by bike. And we'll see who finds the goal first. <laughs> but anyway, yes, that did happen. And guess what? The authorities eventually caught up with Boone Helm. Who was, by the time they caught up with him, strangely alone. Mm. The person he was with has never been identified. He was taken into custody easily. He gave his arresters no trouble. In fact, they would later describe him as being so gaunt and drained from lack of nutrition and rest that he would likely not have managed to continue to travel much further if he had not been caught. When they asked where the man who he had been accompanying him was, Helm told authorities, Why? Wait, no, give me a second. I have to get my voice. <laughs> Ah, fuck, I can't, I've got... Come on, you can do it. Oh, shit, it sounds so good, man. I have it is. Okay, how about I give him a stupid voice? Okay. Because, nice. like, yeah. screw him. Why? Do you suppose that I'm a fool enough to starve to death where I, when I can help it? I ate him up, of course. Nice, I like that. Does that sound like Boonhelm? That was good. Yeah, actually, it does, you know? Mm-hmm. Close your eyes like Boonhelm's in the yeah. room. You don't want to make him too cool. No, you yeah. don't. He should yeah. have, like, a, a stupid voice. That man was never seen again. And with Helm's track record of returning from hikes alone, there is a little reason to doubt his claims, adding to yet another body to Helm's diet. It looked like Helm was finally going to face justice, and likely the hangman's noose for the murder of Dutch Fred. That is, and it comes back around, it's all about family. <laughs> 
See, three of the Helms boys had already met with violent ends after traveling west between 1848 and 1850, and a fourth brother known as Old Tex seemed to be cut from a different cloth to the others and was employed in a mining operation uh, in Boise, Idaho, 200 miles south of Florence, Oregon. Old Tex heard about his brother's predicament, and out of honestly nothing but like familial loyalty, he upped, left his comfortable surroundings, and set off to try and bail out his brother, get him out of the trouble he was in. Old Tex was known to be a stand-up guy, basically everything Boonhelm was not. Tex, he had once faced down a man with whom he'd had a dispute, leading to the man pointing his revolver in Tex's face. Tex refused the cower and invited the man to finish, pull the trigger, and his enemy found new respect for Tex and the two ended up drinking together, becoming good friends. That was the kind of person Tex was, a persuasive man, and now he would need all of that ability and a fat old wallet to dissuade the potential trial witnesses from testifying against Boone Helm. Even though several witnesses could be found or had died, it didn't take long for Tex to realize that he had an uphill battle ahead of him if he was going to get his brother his freedom. Boone had killed Fred in cold blood in a room packed full of people. It was as nailed as it gets. But then money becomes involved and it's like, yeah, it's actually kind of not nailed really. Because <laughs> money talks and Tex had plenty of gold to spread around. All but one witness readily accepted Tex's offer, with the last holding out for a few dollars more. Tex was happy to make an increased offer, but it came with the caveat that the man must leave the country. And if he didn't, he would have to face Tex once again, and this time Tex wouldn't be quite so nice. The offer was accepted. Tex won his brother's freedom simply out of bribery <laughs> and intimidation. And um, despite being a confessed and proud murderer and cannibal, Boonhelm was free once more. Some people just got all the luck. And old Tex would realize soon he had made a huge mistake. On his release, Tex made Boone an offer to accompany him back to the mines in Boise, where he could get him as much work as he wanted, so long as he was willing to work hard and live as an honest man. If he wanted to fight, however, Tex said he had a solution for that too. If it was only violence he desired, he should at least do it with a purpose. And so Tex offered Boone a second choice. He would provide him with a uniform, a horse, money, and send him on his way to Texas where he could connect with the Confederate Army. Boone, shockingly, opted for the first choice, but then swiftly was like, actually, yeah, no, living a life of a minor, not killing people, me, not for me. Like, he's only 34 years old at this point. I know, it's crazy. And like the shit he's gone through, yeah. I can't imagine he could just get get back into society after that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he tried it and was like, no, nope, not for me. Yeah. Soon he was packing up the promised uniform and heading south with a purse full of gold. He never actually went to Texas and joined in the army because he was like, fuck that shit. I'm just going to go and be an outlaw again. This is the point where I'm like a bit confused about, like, why did he go back for his gold at this point? Yeah, I mean, I guess he's down, well, maybe so far away. I mean, I guess... Going back all the way up there oh, from Boise right. to like Heatley Creek. That's a long ass way. Yeah. Maybe something happened. Maybe something we don't know. Maybe we forgot. <laughs> Maybe we forgot about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just even looking at a... Okay. It would take 297 hours. And it's about a thousand miles. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. Maybe he was leaving it for us. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe he was, just, he was still waiting for... Because this wasn't too long after like that... Po like that other posse is still out to get him. Like the original mm -hmm. one. Uh, so maybe he's still waiting for... I'll wait for things to cool down a little yeah. bit. I'll yeah, go yeah. back in a good few more years. I know where it's buried. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, um, well, that's kind of where he went. He ended up in Montana. And he hung out with the even more notorious Plummer Gang. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. All names. Come on. <laughs> Henry Plummer, the leader, was a... He was an altogether different beast and was considered even by many of his own victims to be a gentleman criminal. To briefly talk about Henry Plummer and the gang, uh, Henry Plummer, he was originally from Maine. He was a, a highwayman, and like Boonhelm and thousands of others, he set out to California, part of the 49ers, the gold rush, and he wanted to make it rich. He was relatively successful. He had a mine, it went well. He was even made sheriff of Nevada City, California. But then, the killing started. At first, he claimed. An abused woman had come to him for help. He confronted her husband, the abuser, shot him in self-defense. Then there was a couple of more killings, and soon he would be arrested and exiled from California. He went to Washington, uh, a few more robberies, but he was always known as like a decent criminal, if that makes sense. And a lot of what was done to protect his family, he robbed. He robbed a lot, but he didn't kill very often. 
and he would later be sheriff of a town and have a little posse. And folk in the town, the town of Bannock, Montana, they began to notice a strange uptick in robberies around the area. He was an interesting guy, Henry, so he was he was sheriff of the town, but they were just robbing everybody in the area at the same time. Like, he was he was investigating himself. And so it was around then Boonhelm joined up, and he enjoyed the camaraderie he found amongst his fellow outlaws, and even found the first man to face him down in a fight, a man named Rumsey. And it's no surprise that the two very scary men became good friends and drinking buddies, and Helm even took up a leadership role within the plumber gang. Helm and the rest of the gang were known to be active across Montana, robbing stagecoaches and reducing travelers of the burden of their wealth. However, the umbrella of protection brought by Plummer's badge kind of made it more of a problem because people would eventually round him up too. It was Boonhelm's involvement with the Plummer gang that led to his walk up the gallows. Just this caught up with Boonhelm in Virginia City on January 14th, 1864. He and several others in the Plummer gang were rounded up and tried in secret. Helm and four others included tree-fingered Jack Gallagher, clubfoot George Lane, Frank Parrish, and Hayes Lyons. They were marched up the gallows. As Jack Gallagher cowered and quivered at his impending death, he decided the noose might not be for him. Then he pulled out a pocket knife and threatened to cut his own throat. Great idea, you're about to be hanged, so you'll just kill yourself uh, instead. All right. Uh, the real uh, room temperature IQ. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, eventually one of the officers was just pulled out a gun and was like, he would, said he would shoot Jack Gallagher like a dog if he didn't put away the knife, which caused Boonhelm to say, don't make a fool of yourself, Jack. There is no use or sense in being afraid to die. Once the men were lined up with ropes around their necks, they were given a chance for their final requests to be heard. Jack Gallagher requested drink whiskey. And he was given one. Hmm. After that, he asked for another, which is, that's pretty funny. <laughs> just keep doing shots. Wait a minute. Like, what's the worst that could happen? You're going to get a hangover? Oh, <laughs> that is good. I like that a lot. <laughs> and so the, uh, the, Fucking executioners were like, yeah, yeah, no, we're not giving more whiskey. And then they were like, all right. As they were being prepared to be hung, Boonhelm apparently asked for Jack's coat, telling him he never gave him anything. Jack replied that the coat would be of very little use to Helm now. No more delays. Jack went first, and Helm was full of comforting words for the man being strangled next to him, saying, kick away, old fellow. My turn next. I'll be in hell with you in a minute. Helm then decided he was going to go out on his own terms, and in one final display of what a giant piece of shit he was, Helm shouted out, Every man for his principles! Hurrah for Jeff Davis! Let her rip! With that, he simultaneously kicked away the box from his feet, and his body is said to have fell with a violent snap that killed him immediately. The rest of the group followed, and Helm fell into the waiting arms of the devil. And that is the story of Levi Boone Helm, the Kentucky cannibal. Final thoughts. <laughs> Are you still thinking about the gold in Keatley Creek? I, where is it? I know. I just want it. I, can, I feel like they still think that call, joke. Calls to me. Calls to me. Oh, the courthouse. The still guy goes to Still trying to finish that joke. Yeah. Save, we can save it for the description. We'll put it in the description. Okay, we'll put it in the description. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you time to think about it. <laughs> but yeah, man, that's the story of Boonham. It was quite the outlier. He was a rabid dog. It's like absolutely unlawless and just. He was just off as a fucking rocker. And how many people do you think he had? I'd say a lot. Yeah, it's, I'd say a metric shit ton. It's kind, of, it's kind of hard to know. Like it's what we've covered today is just what we know. Yeah, but there's a good couple of years where he just disappeared, and God knows where he went or what he done. I kind of feel he on these trips that he took out into the wild because he was very happy being on his own. Yeah, but he he always kind of seemed to bring someone with him. But it was nearly like he was bringing, you know, like. Like sailors would, where they bring chickens and pigs on their yeah, ship. Livestock. He was bringing livestock with him on yeah, his trips, yeah. just in case. But if you're if you're starting off your trip with, I might have to eat you. That's the <laughs> <Yeah>. problem, you know. <laughs> Throwing pepper and salt on them. Yeah. What are you doing, Boone? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> well, speaking of jokes, uh, listeners, don't steal our gold from Keatley Creek, please. And uh, Keith will have a great punchline to the guy is on a horse in a courthouse. Something, something. Pressure's on now, by the way. You're the pressure is on. Yeah. 
a horse walks into a courtroom with Thank you so thing. much for listening. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this whole podcast. Um, please check out the That Chapter YouTube channel where I put out two videos every week, every Tuesday and every Friday with a new podcast episode every Monday. And Shanae. And once again, before I finish up, thank you so much to Scentbird for sponsoring this whole podcast episode. Please check out the links below to get yourself smelling all sorts of good. That's the end of this whole episode. Thank you so much, Keith, for joining me for this whole one. Thanks for having me. It was uh, great. Yeah, always enjoy it. A lot of fun. Always a pleasure, never a chore. Always a pleasure, never a chore. Yeah, getting you, you didn't say it last time, so I'm getting you to say it. No, I'm sorry. All right, thanks guys for listening. Uh, here, listen, as always, take care of each other and yourselves. Love you. Love you. Yeah. Might get...